all children. Now let us begin. I was talking about uh, uh, right mindfulness, or no, uh, I was talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. Noble Eightfold Path. I believe you all know what the Noble Eightfold Path is. Uh, Tessa, can you tell me what the Noble Eightfold Path is? How many steps? What are they? There are eight steps. Yes. What are they? What are the eight? Right livelihood? No, no, beginning, from the beginning. Uh, I don't really remember. Okay, anybody? Uh, okay, let me remind you once again. This time you must write it down. Write understanding right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. You got it? Is anybody right? Yeah? Can you repeat it again? Repeat again? Okay. First, right understanding. Second, right thought. Third, right speech. Fourth, right action. Fifth, right livelihood. Sixth, right effort. Seventh, right mindfulness. Eighth, right concentration. Okay. Now I have spoken on uh, six of them already. Today, and I also spoke on number seven, I gave two talks on number seven, right mindfulness. I think they all must be in your record. Today is the third talk on right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is to pay very clear attention to whatever happening in your mind whenever you do something. You walk talk, think, write, sit down, lie down, run, bend down, eat, drink. So you do many activities every day. While you are doing these activities, you don't pay attention, you may be careful about the activities and pay attention to the activities as well. But that alone is not enough. You must pay very special attention to your mind. Because when you do certain things 
anger can arise in your mind. If you do not pay attention to that anger at that time, you let anger grow and then that can turn into hatred. That will be very harmful to your mind and body. People who get angry very often look very ugly. They get old very quickly. They cannot sleep well, cannot get up well. They can have bad dreams, nightmares, and they lose friends, they lose their jobs, and they also become very nervous, and their health becomes very poor. <clears throat> All this can happen when you get angry. And therefore, as soon as anger arises in your mind, you must be mindful to nip it in the bud. The function of mindfulness is not only paying attention to what is happening in the mind at any given moment, but at the same time understand the danger of that anger. Danger of anger. When you notice the danger, you immediately decide, make effort to get rid of that anger. You remember when I was talking about right effort, right effort has four stages. Effort to prevent some harmful, painful mental states from arising, effort to overcome harmful, painful mental state that is already arisen, then effort to arouse wholesome mental states, like when you uh, notice that anger is arisen in your mind, that means you are angry, immediately become aware of the danger of anger and mindfully use your effort to get rid of that anger and the third stage you cultivate wholesome mental states. What are the wholesome mental states? Living friendliness, we call metta, compassion, appreciative joy. Living friendliness, metta, makes you calm, relaxed, and peaceful. You can sleep well, get up well, and don't have nightmares, next morning you are fresh and you will be loved by others. Your face becomes very bright and clear and beautiful. Others like devas protect you. Animals love you. Neighbors love you. Everybody that sees you loves you. <clears throat> and when you want to focus your mind on an object like your studies, you gain concentration very quickly. And these are some of the benefits of practicing metta. So we cultivate, you arouse that wholesome mental state 
as soon as you got rid of your anger, then that is the beginning, beginning effort. Once begun, we must repeat it. Sometimes people start certain good things and they do it for short period of time and then become sort of complacent, lethargic, negligent, ignore it and get involved in other things and they forget this very important, pleasant, meaningful beginning. So, mindful person doesn't do that. Mindful person want to continue the beginning, the, the, the thing that the person started. So when you start something wholesome, beneficial, meaningful, then you must repeatedly do it again and again and again. Make it a habit. When you make it a habit, then it comes to you automatically. It is ever ready to help you. That is the fourth effort. So all this you can do when you start with mindfulness, paying attention to your mind. Children, no mother, no father, no brother, sister or teacher and friend can help you as much as your good, clean, pure mind can. Similarly, no enemy can do you so harm that impure, unclean, polluted, evil state of mind can do. When the mind is full of defilements, full of impurities, that mind can hurt you more than any enemy. And therefore mindfulness is very, very important. In this practice, we must pay attention to our mind. Remember this, whenever we do something, pay attention to that particular thing, but more importantly, you must pay attention to your own state of mind at that moment. The reason is that we want to get rid of unwholesome, painful mental states and cultivate wholesome mental state. For this reason, we want to pay attention to our mind. This is the path eventually leads us towards the attainment of liberation from suffering. And secondly, and also very importantly, you must pay attention to your own body, feelings, perceptions, volitional activities, meaning thoughts, and consciousness. I repeat these five words. They are called aggregates, five aggregates. What are they? Form, feeling, perceptions, thoughts, and consciousness. Form, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. These are what we call five aggregate. 
So we learn to pay attention to these five aggregates to see how quickly they change. <coughs> they all change. In Dhamma language we call it anicca or impermanent. Impermanence. Impermanence of our form, feeling, perceptions, thoughts, and consciousness. Form is not just what we see in the mirror. When you go to the mirror, you can see your form, but the mirror does not reflect the entire form. Only front part you can see, the back you cannot see. There are blind spots even in the mirror. You don't see the form in that mirror. We must see the form that we take into our mind from through, from through our eyes. Our eyes don't have form. The outside may have forms. Now, it is a very deep part, but I give you some simple superficial aspect of it, the beginning aspect. The deeper part we discuss, discuss when you, perhaps you can learn later on when you grow and you are, when you are matured. At this level understand that we see, our eyes see objects. Then the mechanism in our eyes through the retina, an image will reflect in our brain. And that is the image that you recall whenever you want. Suppose you saw something, a person, tree, animal, and so forth with your eye. And later on, when you come home, close the door, those objects are not there. But the memory is in your mind. The memory is in your mind. That image in your mind is a form. That form is not permanent. Outside form, also permanent, but you cannot see its impermanence because it happens within itself. But you can, you can see the impermanence in the object, in the image that you took into your mind. That image is impermanent. You can see that. The person who does not have mindfulness, sati, keep repeating that image in the mind, thinking that it is permanent. And then as it changes, as it impermanence as it is, then you will be disappointed. First you thought the image was beautiful, pleasant, you like it, put in the mind, and then later on slowly you you when you put it in the mind you cling try to cling to it, try to grab on it, but soon you will realize it is no longer there. That is what is called impermanence. That 
generates unhappiness. Another example <coughs> of impermanence that causes unhappiness. You like certain thing, certain person, certain situation, certain sounds, certain smell, certain sit, certain uh, thing to happen in your own way. When that does, so you like it, that is your desire. You desire somebody to behave in a certain way, but the person be, doesn't behave, behave the way you like. Then you are upset. That is your suffering, dukkha. Why is that? Because you have a desire for the person to behave in a certain way, but the person doesn't behave the way you like. Then you will be unhappy. Why is that? You have a desire. Whenever you have a desire, you also don't know. That is what we call ignorance. You are ignorant of what that other person thinks, how other person behave in the way that you don't like, why that person behave in the way you don't like, what is his background, what is his upbringing, what is his education, what is his emotions. You don't know all these things. You simply expect the person to behave in a certain way. When the person doesn't behave in that way, you get upset, angry, you are disappointed. So you experience suffering at that time, suffering. Mindful person must see this. First, you look at the mind and say how you generate desire in the mind. And with that desire you expect certain person to behave in a certain way. When that person doesn't behave in that way, in the way you like, because you don't know, you get upset. You get even angry. That generates more suffering in you. That is called in Pali Dukkha. I mean, I, give you, I gave you a very simple example, very simple explanation of Dukkha. But it also is much more profound than this, that you will understand when you mature and grow up. So, mindful person see first impermanence, and that which is impermanent is unsatisfactory. And then, you cannot control this. That is, with, with, that, is, that is out of your strength, power, capability, and domain, and, 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 and your uh, domination. You cannot dominate it. You cannot dictate it to behave in a certain way. That inability to control anything, any situation, that inability in you to control anything is called non-self, no self, no soul. If you have soul or self, you should be able to control the environment in your own way. That does not happen. <clears throat> and we have to be mindful of that. <laughs> Things are happening against our wish. Another example. You like certain things. You like certain 
sight, certain sound, certain smell, certain taste, certain touch and certain thought, but they don't happen in that way as well. What you like doesn't happen. What you don't like happens. Certain things you don't like, but that very thing that you don't like can happen. Certain things you like, certain things you don't like, that very thing you don't like will happen. Certain things you don't like, you don't get it. Certain things you like, certain things you don't like, you get it. Certain things you don't like, you like, you don't get it. So, we have to understand this with mindfulness. Uh, for instance, this is a very deep subject, I have to speak several times for you to understand it. For instance, the worldly things like gain and loss, praise and blame, becoming famous and not becoming famous, happiness and unhappiness. And these are happening in the world, whether you like them or not, they are happening. Whether you are man or woman, child or adult, Buddhist or Christian and Hindu, Jew, doesn't matter. These sort of things are happening all the time in the entire world and people face these things. When they face these things, if they are not mindful, they suffer. For instance, <clears throat> when you gain, you are very jubilant, happy, jump up and down, smile, and uh, sometimes you even shed emotional, uh, I mean, uh, shed uh, tears of joy, and even cry out of joy when you gain. And you do the same thing when you lose. When you lose also you cry. <laughs> But the first time you cried because so you gain. Second time you cry because you are very sad, very disappointed, upset, unhappy. That is because of your mindfulness, not, not having mindfulness. If you are mindful, you must you can take both the same way whether you gain or lost. For instance, you, you play games. <coughs> when you play games, game is a game. But some, not only children, even adults, you can see sometimes people play soccer games, football, badminton, tennis, and so forth. When they, in some places, some people, when they lose, they get so angry, they go and beat others. Why? Why? Because they are not mindful enough to accept the loss. They are so egotistic and they are so backward, foolish, they don't understand the danger of beating. 
they sometimes can lose their uh, membership in that uh, team or they may even physically injure the other person and have to go to court and so forth. So many dangerous results. Why? Because they don't accept the loss. Why they don't accept the loss? Because they are not mindful, not careful. They can be careful. Remember, carefulness and mindfulness are not the same. Anybody can be careful. Even sometimes uh, animals walking on uh, some uh, very, very thin uh, stick, they have to be very careful not to fall. That is not mindfulness. Mindfulness is to become mindful not to fall from good to bad, not to fall from good, peaceful, happy, meaningful, beneficial state to bad state. That happens in the mind. So friends, as children, this mindfulness is very, very big subject. I will give many more talks on mindfulness like this, little by little, every, in every talk. I told you at the beginning of this series, I give half an hour talk and the rest I leave out of one hour. Uh, today I spoke little more than half an hour. So you have about uh, uh, 22 or 23 minutes to ask me questions. Let me see. Yes, 10, 20, 3 minutes, 1 minute. Now you, it is your turn. You ask me questions. Don't be shy. Asking questions is the way to learn new things. <coughs> okay. You have a question? Please contact us regarding the articles. Okay, first. okay. Okay. All the previous dumbbells are now available. Okay. Right view. Right view. Oh, okay. Okay. Is it Atula? Yes, Mante, yeah. I have a question yeah. for you. Very good. Uh, you said uh, that uh, mindfulness is keeping uh, focused in mind. And today morning also we discuss about attachment. As I see, there are two aspects of att attachment. One attachment is wanting to make mind. The other attachment is our attachment to processes like compassion and loving kindness. So if you are mindful, you could select which path to take. Is that the right approach? Uh, your f first part of the question, what is the first part again? Now, mind, uh, in mindfulness, we are trying to focus our attention to mind. Yeah. And mind can take, if you take attachment, mind can take two paths. One is wanting to make it mine. That make it, no, one is to make it mine? Yeah, it is me, my... my ah, own, I see, my I own. see. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and the other attachment is on the process, the process of loving kindness and compassion. Oh, so okay. If you, if you do something to your children, you can do it because that is my child, or you can do it as a matter of practicing 
compassion or loving kindness is okay. that the correct way to look at uh, uh let me uh add some uh, light shed little light on your answer you ask a question with the answer in it but i like to clarify that a uh, mindfulness understands if we say i my mind then we are not mindful if in your mind you let i my mind to arise then you are not mindful if you do not allow my i my mind to arise in your mind you are mindful because i stands for uh, conceit my stand for possession myself stand for wrong view we are not supposed to nourish these two aspects i my mind that is the whole problem so when we are mindful we have to perform our duties of course we have to use the word i in order to in order to express to communicate even the buddhas did that uh, we have to use i for that only for that purpose only for communication but we do not we want to uh, believe that there is such a thing one thing second is practicing metta loving friendliness loving friendliness we do also without i consciousness <clears throat> my way of explaining very simple way of practicing metta is directional directional means you practice metta to eastern direction and say may all beings in the eastern direction be well happy and peaceful then south eastern direction south and southern direction south western direction western direction north western direction northern direction north eastern direction and then up and down ten directions you don't get involved you you in yourself you simply wish may all beings be well happy and peaceful in all these directions when you repeat this in words several times then you return your mind to yourself then you will notice that your mind is filled with metta you first forgot i my mind but eventually metta is built cultivated in your own mind that is how we practice metta without i my mind see the ಕರಣೀಯಮೇತಸುತ್ತಿಯಂಚ may i be well happy and peaceful and so forth they are buddha instructed us to practice metta without any condition to all 10 directions and that is how we do that is how eventually buddha said etan satin aditya with this mindful practice this mindfulness there he said mindfulness the word he used the mindfulness sati what is that sati not to bring 
I, my mind into the picture. I, my mind remains outside. That is the clarification I want to make uh, to your questions and your own answer. <coughs> that is what is called unconditional metta. Uh, sad, sad. Okay. Anybody has any other question? Where are these children? Do they have any question? Uh. <laughs> yes. Um, I I have a question. Yeah, with that, yes. Um, so, uh, I understood your talk today. I have another question, not yeah. regarding to the talk. Mm -hmm. So, in one of the uh, Buddha's previous lives, uh, I heard, like, the story that uh, he, like, watched, like, a fish out of water, like, suffering type of thing. And um, during what when in his uh buddha life uh he he received like these headaches he had a headache is that is that true buddha had a headache yeah due to um yeah, yeah. the suffering in his previous life okay this is very good uh, with that uh, good question yes buddha had headache buddha had backache and so forth Ache and pain is one thing and suffering is another. <laughs> as long as we have the body, we have aches and pain. The Buddha had this body, so he had aches and pains, but he did not have suffering. Suffering is, you can eliminate suffering, but not the pain. So Buddha did not have suffering at all. Suffering arises from greed, desire, resentment, anger, and so forth. So when our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and so forth, meet with their respective objects, sight, sound, smell, and so forth, if those objects are very present to our eyes, we will develop, we, we will have a desire. If the object happen to be unpleasant to our eyes, we will have resentment. So, acceptation and rejection. So long as we have in the mind this attitude, accepting and rejecting, there always is conflict, tension. When there is tension and conflict, there is suffering. That tension is suffering. Buddha did not have that kind of tension. Whether object is pleasant or unpleasant, Buddha had equanimous state, neither pleasant nor unpleasant mental state, because he understood the object exactly as it is. So, uh, but of course he had pain, especially when uh, they were that, uh, uh, you know, hurled a rock on him. The part of the splinter of this rock uh, hit Buddha's foot and it was injured and uh, Buddha had pain. Uh, so because of the body. And Buddha did not suffer from that pain. The, it is a mental state uh, with that. It is the mental state. The suffering is mental state. 
Pain also is mental, but it is uh, as long as the body exists, they exist, so we understand that. Okay? <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay, good question. Uh, anybody else? Where are your other friends? <laughs> and the boy? You don't know. Bhante, I have a question. Yeah. So this deals with uh, like studying for like... Nelly, um, can you show me a face? All right. Okay. This deals with like studying for school and stuff. Eh? Huh? This deals with studying for school. Uh-huh. So you said uh, mindfulness. So... Um, I know some people like to study listening to music because sometimes they say it will help them focus and some people say they don't listen to music while they're studying. So, and um, with mindfulness, it's hard to like listen to the music and be doing the studies like very efficiently and actually learning the material. But also some would say that it's kind of like background noise to help them focus on the study. So, what what would you say would be the best way without the music or with the music? Okay, uh, what's your name? Dalit. Uh, 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 these are uh, you cannot incorporate that into your uh, mindfulness practice. You can be mindful of the state of mind when you study if there are disturbances to block the disturbances if you listen to music now we have three uh, obstacles one is the music one is your attitude other is your study <laughs> three, you are trying to deal with three things uh, with mindfulness you cannot do so many things with mindfulness you can do, even without mindfulness, uh, the mind can do only one thing at a time correctly. And other things, like uh, like you are listening to me now, listening to me, my, my voice, and at the same time you think of something else, you don't get the meaning of what I say, you will mind, your mind will be on something else. Like that when the mind is divided between various things, uh, your mindfulness is also shattered. And therefore, if you have certain disturbances, you pay attention to that and see those disturbances are not something happening to you always. They are not continuous. They are uh, fragmental, uh, fragments broken into pieces, sound uh, waves, uh, and when you see the sound waves, they rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall very quickly. And that is where you have to pay mindfulness, at, mindful attention, to see how quickly they change. And eventually, you g will become so accustomed to listening to that changes and eventually uh, mind would not be interested anymore in that particular disturbance. Mind will return to your study and then you can study. If you struggle, if you struggle with the, uh, with the disturbance, then you try to find an excuse. Now, in the mindfulness practice, no excuse. We must learn to pay direct attention to see it exactly as it is. And then it will be very easy for us to get rid of that disturbance and return to our breath. When we try to handle, you know, juggle too many balls, uh, it will be difficult to be mindful. Magicians can... Sometimes do that. 
and what you call this uh, jugglers can do that. Uh, but uh, even there, you you cannot do it with mindfulness. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, God. you are welcome. Arnea, you have any question? Um, no, Bhante, I understand. Okay, anybody else? We started little uh, late. Uh, anybody, even adults? Amdruni, I want to uh, ask something. I believe uh, one of the children wanted to ask last time, but that uh, not. The question was, if you do, if you had done something bad in the past, is it possible to uh, do something about it and forget it, and you stop it from coming into your mind? Oh yes, that I'm happy that you asked me that question now. Uh, yes, uh, Buddha says when you do certain things in the past, if it is bad, then as soon as you remember you have done something and that was bad, that very moment you determine not to commit it again. And from that time onward, you just do the opposite of it. Do wholesome things, meaningful things, things that make you happy. Keep doing those things again and again and again. And then, eventually, the bad thing will be out of your mind. Good thing will be in mind. And that would be your predominant uh, mental state all the time for your, for the rest of your life. It is just <clears throat> like uh, uh, when you uh, do something bad only once and if you keep repeating it again and again and again and again and again, then that will become a very prominent thought in your mind. Then what about other good things you have done? You, have, you, must spend, you might have spent uh, five minutes, ten minutes, even one hour to do something bad. And then out of twenty-four hours, twenty-three hours you did good things. What about those good things that you have done for twenty-four hours? So you have to uh, cultivate those things that you have done twenty-four hours, at least uh, while you are awake. You may take about eight hours to sleep and one hour you spend doing something bad. So you still have uh, uh, seven hours. <coughs> so, seven hours? Uh, what is the remaining? I forgot my math. <laughs> uh, uh, 24 minus 19, 15 hours. 9 minus, uh, 24 minus 9, 15 hours. 15 hours you have. During those 15, you, whatever you do in sleep, in dreams and so forth is not counted. So, you have done something wrong at, for 1 hour and 15 hours you have left. During these 15 hours you have completely forgotten about everything and do your, your own good work. If you lied, for instance, how long do you take to lie? Maybe one minute or two minutes or five minutes. You gossip and told lies during the gossip. You might take altogether one hour whole day, but still you have 15 hours <laughs> that you have not gossiped. You, do, you dedicate your time for your study, you do your job, take care of your 
parents, brothers, sisters and somebody and get, play games and so on. So you have done so many other things during those 15 hours. So those are the things that you did for your own benefit. Think of them. So Buddha said in Pali, I must say in Pali, Yasapapam katankamam kusalena pitiyati so imang lokam pabhaseti abha mutto vachandima. Yasapapam katankamam. If one has done unwholesome things, that unwholesome thing must be covered with wholesome things. That person will shine like the moon free from clouds. The clouds are those unwholesome things. When they are when they are removed, then you can see the blue sky and moon. Similarly, when somebody does something wrong for a short period and most of the other time the person has done good things, one must think of this majority of good things rather than my minority of wrong things. So that's what one has to do. <coughs> that's a good question for everybody. And uh, uh, it, it, it is easy to do, very easy to do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. If nobody has any more question. We can uh, close the session and uh, see you next Sunday. I cannot hear you. I'm doing next Sunday's cutting, so we will not have a Dhamma talk. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Next Sunday, cutting. And next Sunday, I give a talk on cutting day. I think somewhere around uh, one o'clock, oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I let you know when you when we meet you. And next, oh, I will tell people uh, next Saturday when my Sunday uh, what you call questions and answer period starts. Uh, for instance, this morning I gave a talk. Yesterday morning I gave a talk, and uh, likewise next Saturday. I give a talk to adults and then I uh, announce uh, what time I will give the Sunday talk. Okay? All right, children and adults, thank you for participating. Thank you. And see you thank next you, week. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, bye. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.